Welcome and thank you all for coming tonight. And of course, a very special welcome to our two uh, guests, Heather Henderson, Mary Elizabeth Corwell, for agreeing to take part in what is a, a deep dive back into history and a very uh, personal uh, dive as well. And I think we're in for a fascinating evening. Let me start by acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to their leaders past and present. Now, um, this function has been organised by the Menzies Corwall Group in Parliament and this group is made up of members of both sides, members and senators of both sides of the political aisle who are trying to inject a degree of bipartisanship into the hyperpartisan world in which uh, the, the political debate is now conducted. The group also wants to improve the standard of debate in the chamber and in public life. So you can see that it's not short of ambition. <laughs> it started with some informal lunches during the last parliament, and now it meets for lunch every Tuesday in the members' dining room, meeting at the large table in the centre of the room and agreeing to discuss policy, dialing down the politics and focusing on the things that government, government I guess with a small g, needs to be doing to make Australia a better place for everyone. So it, it focuses on unity, um, which is uh, often lacking in, uh, in political discourse these days. The group was inspired by stories of the friendship between Prime Minister Menzies and opposition leader Corwell, and I think we'll hear tonight some more details of that friendship. Uh, now, incidentally, I'll leave uh, some time, we'll talk to about a quarter to six, I'll leave about a quarter of an hour for questions at the end of our conversation, so if you think um, between now and then of what you would like to be asking. Uh, also, this um, discussion will be turned into a podcast, which we will run on the conversation website, uh, so people who miss it, friends who miss it, you might direct them to it. Now, to start. I want to go right back to your earliest days, your earliest political memory, and ask both of you, did your father's position uh, affect you when you were growing up, for better or worse? And any anecdotes you have of those early days and how political life impinged on you? Can I start with you, Heather? Yes, it's not very easy to answer. I think uh, as a child at school, it was a bit embarrassing if the press started coming in when we were on sports day and there was a picture the next day of Heather almost touching the thing she was supposed to keep on her head, balancing it, walking from one end of the thing to the other. Um, but I think it had the effect at school of politics never being talked about uh, well, not in front of me. Now, you were at Wrighton. I was at Wrighton. In, in Kew. In Kew. And, uh, and you were boarding or a day girl? I was a, well, I was a day girl except when my father was Prime Minister, 39 to 41. And then I went in to the same school as a boarder mm -hmm. because there was only a small group of boarders, about 20, I think. And so I was backwards and forwards, but it was the same school. Mm. So it was... You know, I was very lucky that I did it like that. But, I, and also I had a very happy time at school. And looking back, uh, there's one, one of my classmates, she was first in the class every year, and Dad used to say to me, you could beat Olive Hay easily if you did some work. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, possibly. No pressure there. No, no, no. But Olive Hay turned out to be Senator Zakharov, and she was a Labour <laughs> Member of Parliament. And uh, so, although we didn't talk politics at school, 
certainly a lot of them there I know had different political views from mine, but that's all right. So, Mary Elizabeth, what was your experience going right back? Um, well, you were well known and people tended to draw attention to you and mostly it was quite good, but there were rare occasions like when Dad became a minister and they said in the Women's Weekly that I went to St Aloysius School and the whole group of very young people came to me and said, this is a college, <laughs> you know, and, and this sort of thing. But uh, mostly it was pretty good. And um, um, I went to boarding school for eight years because our house was so busy, with Dad being a minister and then a, a deputy leader. And um, so the phone was going most of the time and the door was going, so my parents thought it would be better to study in boarding school. And I went to Sacred Heart College, Ballarat East, and that was a very good education. My parents came up every two or three weeks. But then during, my brother went for a year and he was going to come back to my father's school, I think, in Joseph North Melbourne. But then he died at 11, so, but I stayed on in Ballarat, yeah. And do you think, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about the pressures on, on families that political life imposes not going to the content of the politics, but do you think that the pressure in fact was less or greater then or about the same? For example, politicians these days, of course, are beset by the 24-hour news cycle. Now, you mentioned, Heather, people, the media going to, to your sports day, but now there'd be not you know, mm. one or two, but 20. Uh, on the other hand, um, the travel then was much more difficult than it is now when you can whip around in an aeroplane more more easily, obviously, there were planes. But, so how do you think the, the sort of life conditions varied from then to now? Well, I think they varied a lot. Um, for one thing, air travel was on a DC-3 at Dakota, small plane. And they all shared. And I can remember going with my father on one election tour. And Dr. Everett was the leader of the Labour Party, the leader of the opposition. And as we got on one plane, someone from the press said, he said, Dr. Everett, who do you think is going to get in? Well, Everett was notorious for being a very nervous air traveller. And he said, the pilot, I hope. <laughs> 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 but, but it was... It was very, um, very different because I think because Parliament was in a physically smaller and they all knew each other, it's very hard to be nasty to somebody you actually know. And so the arguments were about policies rather than people. And I think that's a huge... I'm not answering your question, am I? Shut up, Heather. <laughs> go no, no, you do go on. <laughs> No, I, I, it was more difficult in the sense that they were public meetings and that doesn't happen now in the same way. I mean, my father would make two or three speeches in a day quite easily going around the country and all over the country, all the way around. So it, physically it was an effort, a lot of tra travel. Men mentally, of course, it was an effort. And I think these days a lot of it is done by broadcasting and or television and so they just can stay in one place and I think physically it was much, it's much easier now. When he travelled did he have uh, some sort of security with him? I mean nowadays for oh. example if the Prime Minister just goes into the press gallery he'll have a, a couple of security men mm. but it wasn't like that? Not at all, not at all. No. Well, it was in his time they brought in security and decided he should have a, a guard of some sort. Well, it was just laughable. It, it, it was useless. And so we had no real experience. I mean, at the lodge, yes, they built a little guard house. They got a guard who was on it, walked around occasionally. But the fence was a couple of strands of wire. Anyone could walk in and out. And, and indeed they did. Neighbours and... So, oh, yes, neighbours or whoever you like to mention. I mean, at the time when my mother was doing the carving and somebody came in and said, 
Madam, there's a man in the kitchen. So armed with a carving knife, she walked out of the kitchen. The little man took one look at this fierce woman and shot out the back door. <laughs> and, and she went over to the back door, which had, you wouldn't even see it now, a little sort of flimsy door with a bit of netting on it and a little snib like that. And she snibbed it on and said to the girls in the kitchen, I've told you before to keep this door locked. So that was the security. Now, just on this theme of security, Mary Elizabeth, of course, your father had a really dreadful experience yes. of, of being uh, uh, shot at and, mm. and, uh, uh, and, and hit. Uh, what, was, what was that like to mm. the family? Was oh, that was a huge shock. And after that, we had security. Yeah, even uh, when my parents were in Canberra, there was somebody outside. Um, you know, patrolling the street occasionally and that sort of thing. But going back to the lack of um, the earlier times, um, we, um, I think it was more stressful then in a way because my father had um, one member of staff as a member and then he had two, two information department, which has a wonderful history that hasn't been really recorded fully, and, the department of, and then the Department of Immigration as well. But once he became deputy leader, he didn't have any personal advisers. They were permanent parliamentarians, mm. permanent public servants. Then he had a couple of people when he was deputy leader, and he was leader of the Australian Labor Party with the responsibility for the whole of Australia, and he had one uh, five staff members for his electorate and the whole of Australia altogether, and briefly six. And he only had about three VIP flights in his life, mm and he had to go from commercial aircraft. 1966, when he was turned 70, he, one day in August, when it was very hot in Queensland and freezing in the south, he had meetings from Townsville, Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart, all by commercial flights. And, um, you know, they, you had to be self-motivated uh, self um, and um, you couldn't really, uh, you know, um, pass over work to somebody else um, and you just had to get it done, you know. There was no, um, he had a, you know, a very well organised electorate and he mm. knew everybody because mm. he grew up in it and had family that was in the area for four generations from 1856 intermittently and his father had been a policeman there so, and later superintendent, so he, um, he was well known and he could rely on people. And there was a great emphasis on loyalty too. So you think things in those days were probably harder in a, a sort of um, physical and organisational oh, yes. sense than, yeah, and than now? The, particularly during the war. I mean, people like Bill Reardon from Kennedy, he got home, it took him three days to get home. It took Victor Johnson, who was also a minister a week to get back to Kalgoorlie, and he'd go about every three months and they worked 16 hour days. They had beds that were into the wall that you pulled down in the old parliament house. And, um, but they were a team, they all knew each other. And on, our, on the Labor side, they'd mostly been on, at state conferences, at federal conferences, union conferences. So they all knew each other before they even got into parliament. Mm. And, and they all had experience and it was, the emphasis was on um, empathy and knowledge and experience to be a member. And so it was a much more a team spirit, I think. A more intimate setting. Yes, but also um, a sense of community, I think, yeah. I'd like to turn to what your father saw as their greatest achievements and their greatest failures. Could you start? Mary at Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> You're passing the bucket. <laughs> yeah, I sure am. Well, she um, sees you've got some notes, so... Well, she's... I did, I did, actually. <laughs> I, I mean, only because I spoke to you yesterday and you said you can do, take notes. And I thought if I want to quote figures, I'd better... I mean, this is an open book exam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I just refer back to... Could, can I just go back to the previous question? One of my early memories in Parliament was seeing Maxie Falstein, who was a federal member for Watson. He was a very charismatic, handsome man and he was in the Air Force, and he walked into the house after a mission, and the whole place just erupted, you know? He was, he was just so charismatic. And then he, 
um, got into trouble with the Air Force. He was still a federal member, but he had to accept punishment from the Air Force. And after that, he was promoted. And, and, uh, and then, unfortunately, he lost in 1949 and died young. But, you know, he had some really colourful characters. You know, Eddie Ward and um, uh, W.C. Wentworth. And there were lots of them. And Dorothy Tanley was the first woman. And she was there on her own, um, through her own achievements. She had a Bachelor and Master of Arts from Western Australia, which was free. And she was the only woman in the caucus from 1943 to 1968. And I think she should get more honour than the quarters are so far. But she, you know, she coped very well. Um, and, and, but unfortunately, she wasn't a minister. But, um, and also, there was more humour in the House, I think. And they didn't get all emotional about budgets. They said, hear, hear, and that was it. They weren't sort of... <laughs> well, maybe the, um, the quick humour in the House was partly because there were so many stump speeches that they were given to, uh, giving, so they were used to dealing with that's interjections right. they're used to talking and, and, yeah, that's right. and, and it was all less prepared, as it were, do you Yeah, think? well, from Dad was 20, he um, was um, having... A, um, public meetings, street corner meetings yeah. against conscription, and then right through his career, you know, there were street meetings and then they'd be on back of trucks and then they'd be in big halls, and that made politics much more a, a democratic and community-oriented society. Too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and people, you know, a lot of it was very witty too. Yeah. Now I have yeah. to bring you back to the achievements. Okay, sorry. Um, Thank you, yes. Well, I suppose <laughs> immigration, which um, Geoffrey Blaney said was the greatest achievement of the 20th century on the Labor side, and Bob Hawke said it was the greatest achievement. And um, Josie Zabriskie, Professor Josie Zabriskie said that Dad was the person who introduced multiculturalism. We had seven and a half million people in 1945, and by the time um, Labor was defeated in 1949, and despite a, a drastic, drastic lack of shipping, um, we had um, over 100,000 British migrants, over 50,000 displaced persons and many, many thousands of sponsored migrants and, and also agreements with some other countries. Some had had to be deferred, like with Greece and Italy, because of political situations. But um, it, it was a huge achievement and, um, and it's, been, it's become a maelstrom of myth and misrepresentation. But um, he also tried to change the law on Chinese residents and because of the post-war environment, um, they changed the regulations, but it took till 1956 to change the law completely. To um, do what? To give Chinese residents um, citizenship. Mm -hmm. And um, then also he um, maintained the distinction between church and state, and he also um, opposed the Vietnam War, which ultimately was confirmed. And um, I was just probably keeping cool, calm and collected in, despite the um, winds of change around him, you know. What about the downside? What did he feel he hadn't achieved or that had gone wrong? Did he talk about failures much? Well, I think he was very disappointed with respect to the 1961 election when we had equal numbers of seats and over 300,000 out of 5 million voters majority um, uh, we had a primary vote of 300,000 more than the Liberal Country Party. Um, and Northern Territory and ACT weren't counted and they were Labor seats. And 23 seats in Victoria went to the Liberals on um, DLP preferences. And Jim Killen, who was a great friend of Derek Slater, he, his third preferences put the government back. So that was a close call both ways. Mm -hmm. And then 1963, it was... Kennedy was shot before the week before. And in 1966, Gough Whitlam had started a campaign at the beginning of 1964 and admitted in March 1966 that he was the author of several documents. And then in, during the election on the Monday and the Wednesday, he contradicted our policy on Vietnam. And um, anyway, we lost. But it wasn't such a big vote and when you can, big loss when you compare it to others that it was made an issue at the time. This yeah. relationship between your father and, and Gough Whitlam, what was that like? Not good. 
always not good or it well, got worse over time? Well, initially they worked well together, although Dad preferred Eddie Ward, and who'd been a long fr a time friend and a, you know, an intimate, with an intimate knowledge of politics. Um, and um, well, Whitlam said he was going to be leader. He was destined to be leader. So and was this a sort of old bull, young bull situation, or was it a situation uh, that was an argument about policies? You mentioned Vietnam in particular. Well, it was a combination, I think, because um, um, Jim Killen said in the parliament, people should read Hansard, but anyway, he said that um, Whitlam was the best example, equivalent to these words, the best example of somebody from the upper middle class who attached himself leech-like to the egalitarian movement. And um, Dad wrote to him, Whitlam, and after when he um, stood down in 1968 and was just beat Jim Cairns and said that he was never a Labor man in the true democratic socialist sense here. So. Now, Heather, back to you on achievements. Your father had views on Mr Whitlam too. <laughs> I think it's best left to the historians. I don't think I'm the right person to judge what is. But what, what did your father think were his big achievements? I don't know. We didn't talk about that very much. <laughs> and uh, I, I honestly don't think I can answer it. Yeah. Let's talk about the interaction between the two of them. Yes. Can you tell us something about how your father saw Mary Elizabeth's father, and what you know of the contacts they had and what they, what he said about... Well, I think in a way it goes back further to uh, Chifley and Curtin, or Curtin and Chifley, and my father was very fond of both of them. And so it was, in a way, customary for him to get on with his opposite numbers. And they were really, really good friends. And we're, we're talking now about we're, this is back during the war, or just oh, at the end of right. the war. I yeah. mean, it was okay. Chifley, uh, Curtin yeah. and Chifley, and uh, just after the war. There was a story um, that they used to exchange whodunits. Is that? Yeah, right? Oh yes, oh yes, yes. Chif, Chif would ring Dad and say, oh, "Bob, I'm sick of it all. Come round and have a yarn." And uh, so they would do exactly that. Sounds might even be mine. Um, and uh, so they. Uh, you know, they knew each other well and they talked about things completely, uh, not politics. Yeah, what sort of things? Uh, uh, oh, the whodunits or what was going on somewhere else, but anything at all. Uh, the same as you would with your friends. You just talk yeah. about what interests them at the time and what you're doing. And uh, so there was that great sense of, in a way, camaraderie that they got on. And not only with the leaders, but with um, some of the other, you know, the Labour members of Parliament. He got on very well with a lot of them. So when Mr Cole uh, became opposition leader, it was no surprise at all that they got on well. And I know, I think I said before, they sat next to each other at the cricket and the football, partly as a defence against other people coming and talking to them. And... <laughs> But they, because they were both in politics, they, they knew all about what went on. But on a personal level, they had quite a lot in common and they really were able to sit down and talk like friends. It didn't matter what their politics were. They, um, they just got on. And it makes for so much happier government if it can be like that. Yeah. And yet, uh, at least in some of these periods, the political debate was very intense and fractious, wasn't it? I'm sure it was. Um, mm. And those times, say in the 50s, the whole communist thing, Petrov, etc., the relationship still was it still was survived okay that. in survived, those it, days? It survived. Well, no, I can't say that Dad got on particularly well with Dr Everett, but, um, but I like his daughter. And we get on with. But but you what you are saying is that through these years, and we're talking about a big span here, even even though they weren't direct opposites, obviously the whole time. But in all those years, you remember it. 
you remember it as smooth rather than these yes, rough patches sure. being disruptive. Yeah, and, and of course there were rough patches, of course there were. Mm -hmm. But um, on the whole, uh, they, you know, they were, they were friends, they respected each other. They respected the fact that they had different views and they were prepared to talk about it and try and sort things out. So I think it made not only for a happier atmosphere, but also for a better result. Do you think that in those days there was more trust in politics? Trust has become, or lack of it, a big issue in recent times. Mm -hmm. What you're feeling about those earlier times, both from the community uh, and uh, its reaction, but also among the politicians? Um, people are people, and some you like and some you don't. And I think it's the same thing applied there, that uh, a lot of, if somebody was trustworthy, they were trusted. But if somebody was not, he was not trusted. And I think it just worked the same as any community, that they, some, they got on with some and not with others. But a lot of them, they could talk about things in a civilised way. And I think, I think it was a much, much happier atmosphere uh, for all sorts of reasons, a lot of which are out of our control. I'd like to say that they both respected the Westminster system as being the best available. And um, uh, also, um, it's worth mentioning too that um, my, uh, at the Currajong Hotel, which was mostly Labour people with a few others, uh, including Zara Holt when she married Jeff Bates and the McEwans, who at least lead of the country party, but generally it was a more or less Labour environment. Everybody knew what everybody was doing. The members sat in the tables in the middle and Dad sat beside Chif uh, Chifley on his right when he died. He went into that chair. There was a wonderful woman called May who ruled the place. And then the public servants who'd come up from Victoria in the late 19... Um, 20s and 30s, they sat in another area and the secretaries were on the far side and Mr Chifley did not have an affair. And there's a wonderful book written by um, Gil Duthie, who was a Methodist minister, who was a member for um, Bill Woodmont, I think. But anyway, he, he wrote about that last night of Mr Chifley's life. My mother sat up with Phyllis Donnelly and she was babysitting the Beasley children that's Kim, Kim today, and his sister, and um, because it was a big ball, and then everybody came back early because Mr. Mendes announced that Tiffley died suddenly, and there was, you know, there was a lot of interaction between people, um, and you know, there wasn't the bitterness. There was just um, you respected each other's position, and um, you, you adhered to it, but you respected that there was an alternative here. What was Canberra like in, in those days? Because Western it was time. a very small place. Question time was the best show in town, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was spontaneous. It was witty, wasn't it? It was interesting. I went from early, I started school. My mother used to bring us up to meet our father again, you know. Mm. And we used to watch Question Time for several years. In fact, your father once, Dad came home when he was in, after visiting him in hospital, saying how he was talking about my little brother running down as a toddler to, um, to the front of the house where the ministers were sitting to my father. And, you know, the family sat in the... In, in, in the in the, in, in the speaker's gallery at the right. back, mm. yeah. And, um, you know, it was a real community. And the wives that didn't who weren't interested in politics, and particularly some of the older women, used to sit in a lounge in Karajong Hotel, and they knew what everybody was doing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, Mary Crean said once that after Frank was elected, she thought, oh, well, I must be sociable, and I'll go and sit with them. But she went to sit down, and they said, that's Mrs. So-and-so's chair. <laughs> you know, and she, but it was a sense of community, and it was like a big boarding school in a sense. So everybody... They say that now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now it's different. At King's Hall, everybody had to pass everybody. Everybody knew what was happening. The media used to hang around the edge to see who was talking to whom. But now it's, you're like in a fort, aren't you? You could be lost. I said to somebody here, you could be lost for a week. And they said, oh, no, the clean would find you. you know, so. <laughs> but a lot of it's because of security. That's why it's changed so much. 
old Parliament House, you could go into King's Hall and schoolgirls could walk in and say hello to Mr Ward or Mr whoever, any, any of the members of Parliament, or they could talk to them. And it was much easier and freer in those days. So do you, how do you compare the two um, Parliament buildings? Do you think that political transactions were also easier then, not just access? Yes, I do. I do. For lots of reasons, but I think the new Parliament House is so big and you've got the, all the security and ministers' offices are, and I'm sorry if there isn't, but they're sort of packed with yes men. They're all political appointees. And I mean, in the olden days, you'd have a typist and whatever secretary, but also somebody from the department who would come and be a secretary. And certainly the minister could have a veto on it, but otherwise he took what he was given. In terms of staff? In terms of the staff. And I can't remember there ever being any political people in my father's office, ever. And, and so he was not surrounded by people who saying, you're doing a good job, everything is perfect. They've got people there who are prepared to say, I think you, you might have difficulty if you go ahead with that. And they could hear the other side, which made a big difference. And I think that's... And also in the old Parliament House, they all fell over each other. They didn't all have their beautiful offices to go back to. And so they mingled and they knew each other. They ate together. They did everything together. Mm -hmm. And so they knew each other and they knew the press. The, the people in the press gallery knew them. So I think that made for much better government because they understood each other. They could talk about all sorts of problems and try and get it right. Um, Dad used to make a speech and then he'd have a cup of tea with Larry Anthony Senior or with, um, um, later, that, with that Doug. Was Doug's Father, yeah, mm. and with Doug later, and Doug came and sat on the arm of Dad's chair the last night he was in Parliament, and um, Dad and Ad Artie Fadden used to have a um, cup of tea. Also, um, oh, Billy Kent Hughes was a good friend. Dad had won a court case against him in the 1930s, and he left the Victorian government. Um, to re-enlist. He'd been in World War I, he re-enlisted in World War II and then he came back after World War II into the federal parliament with uh, mm -hmm. the new party your father formed. So, um, yeah, and then um, our fathers used to have a drink often, you know, later in the night and um, it was just a spontaneous friendship. Dad used to write speeches for members. I remember he wrote the third maiden speech for the member for Eden Manera once <laughs> when he was leader. <laughs> And, and, and some unionists too, and he wrote be just, uh, Labor's role in modern society while he was leader. A lot of it was taken from other sources. It wasn't ghosted. Mm -hmm. It was, ta you know, it was a com brought together, but it was his, his writing here. Yeah. Now, Graeme Freudenberg, who uh, recently died, started working for your father, didn't yes. he? And then moved on to others? He... Or moved on to Goffwood? Yeah, my father was a pretty tolerant employer. Graham was a clever writer, but um, he, that film, I think, was a bit eclectic and misleading. And as a friend said to me, it was rather sad that he led his life through another person, in a way. But um, there are lots of statements he made that I, that I, I think are, unnecess are, are unfair, because his, he was then dedicated to promoting Whitlam as a major person. Uh, Heather, you were mentioning the staff situation. Uh, what did you pick up from your father about his opinions on the public service and, and he, their role in things? And often these days, I think we find governments rather in, impatient with the public service and we've got a, a doctrine of the public service should be more responsive. What was Bob Menzies? Uh, he view? was very, he was impressed with the public service anyway, but 
He was determined to make it better and better, and it was completely apolitical. Mm -hmm. And that is the big difference now, that there are a lot of political appointments to the public service. And in those days, I don't think there were any. And he respected them, and he respected their expertise in whatever department it was. And he certainly was prepared to listen to their advice. And what public servants would you say he was closest to? Do you? Oh, well, I suppose the people in his own prime yeah. minister's Was there department. anyone in particular? Any pe one in particular? Yeah, any public servant in particular? Oh, um, John Bunting? Well, yes, I suppose Jack Bunting was, uh, he referred to as the prince of public servants. And he got on very well with him. But there were others. Some of the uh, men who became his secretary, private secretary, mm -hmm. in their younger lives, like Bill Heseltine and uh, Jeff Yeen. Jeff went on to become the secretary of foreign of, of prime ministers. So I think he was very. Um, he, he was impressed with most of the people in his department. I think. And he was very keen on them being apolitical. If any of them said anything political to him, he, sa he would say, I'm not interested in your politics. I just want to know what you think about this problem or that problem. Do you think he had any senior public servants whom he'd think were Labor voters? Oh, probably. I don't know. Oh, yes, well, he must have, because I, I know when he first got in, somebody... Um, came to see him from his department and said, Mr Menzies, I think you should know I didn't vote for you at the last election. Or another one who was president of the local Labour Party. And Dad said, I'm not interested in your politics. Well, actually, my, when my father started work, um, he um, then became, uh, he was been about 16, he then became secretary of his local branch when it was illegal for a public servant to be a member of a political party. He was in the Victorian Public Service. Mm. And then in 1916, when he was 20, um, it became legal. Um, but he believed public servants should be apolitical. Mm. He appointed Tasman Hayes as the head of immigration, and he served under five ministers for immigration. And Bob Armstrong, who was almost like a son to my father, they were very close. He was his personal secretary, but he later Dad relinquished, was quite happy to relinquish his services because he got promoted in the department and he ultimately became secretary. And they had a very close friendship, but they were all objective. And that all happened until the 1970s. And when I was in the Department of Labor and National Service, and we all got a shock when Dr. Cook was changed after 1972 because it just hadn't happened before, as far as we knew. He went off to Geneva. but. It's much better to have an objective public service and you have your private views like your private religious beliefs, but you serve the government of the day and members were meant to serve the public. It was a more democratic parliament because they had such a range of occupations rather than now. And a degree is not essential. Mm. It's, you need, as I said, empathy, knowledge and experience. It may be an enhancement but sometimes it can make people more individualistic and more opinionated rather than following the party policies. That's my view anyway. <laughs> can I ask you about overseas travel? Because overseas travel was um, somewhat burdensome or at least somewhat extended uh, in, in these earlier decades. What are your memories of that, Heather? I've got plenty, actually. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> She was about five of, minutes. She's the wife of a diplomat too. So. Um, I don't know what, quite what was the question. Just uh, overseas. Uh, your your memories um, of your father's trips, well, because uh, one trip the, when he was first prime minister, of course, was a Fort bit Dunham of a disaster Fort because yes. it, in, it helped end that prime ministership, didn't it? Yes, it did. Tell us about that. And well, he went. It was he travelled by seaplane, um, and he was away for a long time. But he went to the Middle East, which meant he saw the troops in the Middle East, which was, you know, a great opportunity. And took the home movies. 
And what? Took some home movies? Or oh, was that yes, a later yes. trip? No, no, it was on there. Somebody gave him a, ca a movie camera. He took it with him and he took a lot of films and they have turned out now to be rare because there are very few films in colour from that time. So they're very popular with the, the television people. But, but the trip was uh, politically a bit of a, a disaster. Tell us about that, because well, he was away too long, right? And, and oh, yes, the he, mice played Oh, yes, as far as that's concerned, yes, he was away too long. And my mother did warn him and say, you know, when, if you stay, unless you come home, you won't be there very long when you get back. And she was right. But uh, he was defeated by the people on his own side, of course. But that's another did, story. Did he usually take your mother's advice, though, albeit not on that occasion? He often took her advice on about people, because he thought she was better judge of people. And was she? Sometimes. <laughs> What about your father's... Um, well, he was a member travel. for 32 years and he had three overseas trips. There were no study tours, there were no committee tours. Um, he went in 1947 with my mother and Bob Armstrong, possibly the shortest, the smallest mission ever that po started the post-war immigration scheme, where, as Dad had said in his first speech on the 2nd of August 1945, all people within the existing legislation were welcome. And in 1946, they heard out about displaced persons, but it wasn't there was a shortage of British or they, they, they were looking for people everywhere and they could. And so that was 1947 and they went by flying boat to England and then they went to, um, I think it was 23 countries in 12 and a half weeks. The RAF lent them a plane for the continent of Europe um, and they came back via Canada and America. Um, and then in 1963, I was with my parents for seven weeks um, when um, I negotiated some leave and um, the Reserve Bank and... Um, we, he, that was to do with the European Economic Community. So we went to the Middle East and Europe and America. And, um, and that was very interesting. And I was, prior to that, there was a world tour of 1963 and my mother had an operation, so I stood in for her for that tour and that was very interesting. Um, and then in 1967, after he, my father had retired from the leadership, um, we went again for a longer time, I went with them, and Lord Casey was then Governor-General, and he lit up Admiralty House as a farewell gesture, which was lovely. And, um, and then we went, we were in Russia and um, Poland and um, Italy. We were just by chance we were at the coronation of Pope Paul VI, and then next time at the synod, opening of a synod of bishops. But, uh, and the ecumenism was evolving then, which Dad had always been involved in. Um, and, um, and the first earlier time we'd spent, met Golda Meir and um, President Saragat and people like that. Um, and then in 1967 we also... Um, I'm just trying to think now. It was a longer trip, but we did this all quite a... But they were mostly meetings. Yeah. There was a, a, to be a big meeting in the USSR and then Korea pulled out and so that was um, deferred but we still went and there was a big Labour conference in England and there was a big um, dem a socialist conference in um, Zurich. It is, so, it is quite um, a contrast though, isn't it, with these days when mm -hmm. a Prime Minister, well, Scott Morrison's going to be away a week, yeah. Prime Ministers feel they can't be out of the country for, mm. for too but long. But they have the facilities. I mean, in those days, you went for, if you went away, your father, it would be a lot, a lot of it to be travel. Mm. I mean, it took... It took a long um, time to get there. It took mm. six days by flying boat to yeah. get to, to London, yeah. you know. And, and before that, of course, by ship. And then all mm. the news you'd get would be by cable. And that really stunned the British, that Dad made an agreement, uh, discussed something, and the next morning came back and said, oh, the next morning they had a meeting and said, it's all settled on immigration in England. And they couldn't believe that it would, they'd take two weeks. But he'd sent a cable to Mr Chifley, who was a very close friend, and he'd sent one back overnight. 
But that didn't happen with, you know, they, they had a more ponderous approach and the yeah. Australians were regarded as, you know, a bit... At the cutting of, edge. Of yeah, a bit... Communications you know, technology. Unconventional, yeah. Now, I'm going to open it up oh, excuse now. Excuse me, can I want to say yes, one of course. thing that I'd like to say? I'd like to say something about the Nationality and Citizenship Act and as I've told John Alexander, he'll be interested. I suggest you read the um, second reading speech in November 1948 it was the um, National Citizenship Act that was pro um, promulgated on Australia Day 1949. And we were part of the, we were a colony, then we were a dominion, we were part of the British Empire, then the British Commonwealth. So after, once Dad became minister in 1945, he promoted Australian identity, which was existed, but it was a very specific um, effort. And, um, then Canada got um, citizenship in 1946, and in late 1948, we passed. This bill was passed, and in it it says that we had Australian citizenship. We welcomed everybody to become an Australian citizen, and for any British people, because we were still part of the British Commonwealth, um, British people here could register, but they retained all their rights. As in Australia, including standing for Parliament. And that was the case, on, according to the legislation, till 1984. And, and it was, the final detail was decided in 1986. So that's another way of looking at that subject. <laughs> we were a sovereign country, and we, what other countries did was their business. Um, as Maria McAnew and I discussed recently, young boys of Italian and Greek background used to come to, um, used to stay away from those countries until they were 26, so they wouldn't be conscripted. What they did was their business, what he, we did was our business. And that was the situation. I'd also like to say that my father would be absolutely delighted, the little girl that came from a Greek island at the age of four, became the federal member for Colwell, <laughs> and she's held for 18 years, and I hope a lot longer, as she should, successfully. Yeah. You would think, please. All right, well, look, thank you both, and uh, we'll open it up to questions. I think there's a microphone. Has someone got a microphone? Oh, incidentally, I could mention that the Irish got a special inclusion. They were included as a gesture with the British, although they were distinctive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were still discussing aspects of citizenship to this day. I think yes. legislation is uh, around. Who's going to be first? Can we just wait for the microphone? Thanks, I'm Julian Lisa. I'm the federal member for Barara. Um, it's such a privilege to be here today and to hear you both. I'm sorry I, I didn't get to hear the very beginning of the discussion, so you may have covered this um, before I came in. Did the children of parliamentarians socialise very much um, in, in the time when both your parents served? And had you had a lot to do with each other over the years, or is this a, a pretty much a one-off occasion? Oh, we've been in touch from time to time yeah. over the years. Um, for... Heather was ahead of me, but um, the children at the Hotel Courageong did play together um, when they, during the school holidays. But um, we also, I can remember going to the Indian High Commission when I was seven, um, and also I played tennis with the daughter of the American ambassador, Sandra Khan. But as far as we were concerned, we were sort of... We were different yeah, ages. Different ages. Um, but we've met socially several mm. times. Yeah, and I met her parents even more so because um, Heather was married and, and I'd be in Canberra mm. sometimes uh, and I met her parents, yeah. Mm. But yeah. can I just add to that that um, I, Rony Caritas, who's Dr Evert's daughter, is m nearer my age and we had babies together and we lived round the corner. So we knew each other very well and continue to be friends. So that was you know, an okay thing, it was good. Yeah. Could I just say one quick thing? Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say about multiculturalism, it's a, it's a function of familiarity and numbers 
that helps people to understand each other. And, and that's, it's, it's not just you can say this or you can say that. It's, I mean, that's been the wonderful achievement in Australia and like other countries, that Dad set up Good Neighbour Councils and various other groups, and they've continued in various ways. But that was better then because people learned about Australia and they learned to understand each other. And then as more come, people understand more, I think. I think also that was a very special period in a way because it was so soon after the war that mm. everybody had been through these mm. dreadful experiences mm -hmm. and they were so anxious to you put all that behind them and right, yeah. it was a period of growth and hope yeah. for the future. Yeah. Now, more questions. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Kevin Andrews. Um, Mary Elizabeth, you said that um, the Labor members tended to stay at the Currajung Hotel. My question is, uh, well, to both of you, but particularly to you, Heather, did the Liberal and uh, then Country Party members stay at some other hotel, or what? Canberra. What was the the Canberra? Was it now the Hyatt? Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't hear all that. They, but they, they stayed at the Canberra. Yes, yeah, so the Liberals stayed the at the Canberra, Canberra and, 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 and the wealthy Labor lawyers stayed at the Canberra. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, the lower classes stayed at the Courage <laughs> Maria Van Bake, you know, the member for Corwell. Um, Mary Elizabeth, um, I know you may wish to address this, but the infamous two Wongs don't make a white statement uh, that your father has been uh, forever, is often remembered for and therefore decried as the racist for having said that. Will you explain the context in which that statement was made and the purpose of it? Yes, another good reason that people should read Hansard. Mm. Um, Rupert Ryan, who was the brother, uh, brother of Lady May Casey, asked a question about the wrong Mr Wong getting a deportation notice. And my father said, there are many Wongs in the community. And at the same time, Tommy White, Thomas White, whose wife is a descendant, was a descendant of Alfred Deacon, and his daughter Judith I know well, um, and you would know, um, she, um, he was interjecting. And Dad just said spontaneously, two Wongs don't make a white, meaning you. And the, an English journalist sent it up to the Straits Times in Singapore with a small W for white. And that's been repeated ad nauseum and outrageously for a long time. So it's, and my father spoke some Mandarin and he was very close to a lot of people in the, in the Chinese communities in 19... Uh, 66, the Chinese community in Melbourne gave him a 70th birthday dinner, and in 1960, the uh, Chinese community gave him um, a big um, a, a, um, a event in, when he became leader. And in Rabaul, the Chinese community put on a great banquet. And there's a, I've got a minute, um, there was a lovely letter sent later about that from a <laughs> patrol officer because a Chinese man whom Dad helped to get a wife to, for him from China uh, had come all the way by boat to see him in Rabaul and because the dinner started he thought it was too rude to come in and then when he tried to see my father the following day he'd already left and that was just because um, Dad had helped him personally. And so there's a lot of nice stories. Of, and my father was very committed to Papua New Guinea and the Northern Territory. And there's a plaque actually in Port Moresby in honour of our family. Um, so, but his emphasis was more in that direction than Europe. Yeah. Can I just add to yes. that, that I can remember my father saying once, never make a joke in front of the press. <laughs> and I think that was the, your father's mistake. <laughs> This is not a question, but a personal statement because I owe both Corwell and Menzies a huge debt. First of all, Corwell, um, I was born uh, to German parents in Palestine before the war and brought to Australia, captured by the British and brought to Australia and interned in, into Tura Victoria. And Corwell in his first year of being immigration minister allowed us, who were enemy aliens basically, to stay in Australia. And that was a huge change in my life. And Menzies later on allowed me to go to university through the Commonwealth Scholarship mm. and supported the ANU and the universities. 
and that enabled me to have a wonderful career doing nothing but physics. So thanks to both gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Julian Fitzgerald, uh, thank you both very much for your time. Just uh, wondering with uh, the Prime Minister about to go to Washington, uh, what your views are on your father's relationship, special relationship and memories of the United States and the President's that uh, they met there? Sorry. United States, relations with the United States. Oh, well, he had very good relations with the people in the United States. He got on well with them. Um, there were a couple of exceptions, naturally enough. And, uh, yeah, I won't get involved in a long story. It's tempting. Get thee behind me, Satan. Um, Sometimes it's good to yield to temptation. <laughs> no, no, I think it might, no. <laughs> but no, he did, he got on well with most of them. Um, he, he, some after he retired, I remember he wrote in one of his letters to me uh, that he thought that, uh, I think it was LBJ, was a great non-listener. Um, but... He certainly got on well with Kennedy and uh, Eisenhower. I know he got on well with most of the leaders that he met there, whom he met, sorry. Mm. I mustn't use that word, that, for people, must I? I think it's all right. It's very common now. <laughs> My father's grandfather was an American and he came to the gold rush as a young school teacher. He left before he was 21. His brother was nearly 23 when they came to the Ballarat gold field, when they left to come to the Ballarat gold fields. And um, their father had served a term in the Pennsylvania legislature in 1820. Um, so my father used to write um, articles for the Age Literary Supplement on um, American history every year for some years, around the 4th of July. But so he was always very, very um, enthusiastic about America, but not necessarily um, their policies weren't as, um, shall we say, democratic as ours. And um, he was naturally more, be more pro-democratic. But when he met Kennedy, he said to him that my family were leaving America when yours were arriving. <laughs> and, and Kennedy said he hoped it wasn't cause and effect. <laughs> I think we've got time for two quick questions. Hi there. Uh, my question's to both of you. Um, these days, I think a lot of kids of parliamentarians would know that election day is a really big deal and that they've spent a lot of weeks with their, with their mum or dad wearing campaign t-shirts, handing out memorabilia, or, well, pamphlets. Um, did you, what was election day like for both of you and how involved were you in the election campaign itself with, with both your dads? Um, well, we were, our place was always in the sort of semi turmoil around election day, and we always had, for many years, we had a big crowd at our place um, on the election night, and then later we had it at the North Melbourne Town Hall. Um, and, you know, we also, of course, went to the opening speeches and all that sort of thing. Um, and, and then from 1958, I think, I gave our tickets every time. Bob Hawke helped us in the 1961 election at the Melbourne Town Hall. And actually, if I can just say a rather a little joke, um, there was this man chasing a girlfriend of mine afterwards when we were having a celebration, and Bob Hawke said, "You let, don't you go near my wife," <laughs> and the man disappeared. <laughs> but anyway, um, we were very involved, and um, you know, it was always a sort of an emotional roller coaster till the night was over. And then in 1961, we didn't know the result till the following Thursday. Um, from the Labor perspective, we would have won if it had been first past the post. Um, but we waited till the Thursday when Jim Killen's result came in. And they didn't have a recount that time, which, which should have really happened. But um, it was a great emotional, it was sort of building up to that for weeks. And then you had the big night and you know, we had more disappointments mm. than you did, but anyway. Well, a, a, lot your of, memories? a lot of that is much the same. Um, but my father would go around every one of the polling booths in his electorate during the day. And that was all good fun, interesting. And uh, I would hand out how to vote cards somewhere. And, but at the end of the day, he had it all typed out with, because no television, it was only radio. 
and he had every electorate and all the candidates and there had to be silence. Do not make a noise because he was carefully listening to the radio and filling in the thing until finally he could say, Phew, we've, you know, we've got over 50%, it's all right. <laughs> or we haven't or whatever it was. But the result was there and was a huge relief. But, uh, and I'll repeat one little story. So I do this, I'm afraid. I'm old, so you've got to put up with it. And uh, there was one, it was late in the day, and the Herald boy was yelling out Herald. So Dad said, uh, come on, Blue, sell me a paper. Because the boy had red hair, so of course he was called Blue. And when he came up, he, Dad paid for his paper, got his paper. And the fellow with Dad said to the boy, Sonny, the man you've just sold the paper to is Prime Minister of Australia. Hey, Mum, he's Prime Minister of Australia and he knows my name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take one final question. Um, uh, Mike Freelander, member for MacArthur. This is probably a really bad question to ask the two of you because you look so healthy. But there's often talk around this place of how unhealthy, uh, physically unhealthy politics is. And I'm interested in what it was like in your time in Canberra. What were the politicians like? Was it a lot of alcohol, a lot of smoking, unhealthy lifestyles? Yeah, both No gym, I think. <laughs> no gym, no. <laughs> Sorry, Heather. No, no, he, he wants to know how much... Whether, no, whether, whether they were more healthy or less healthy. I think the presumption is that they're less healthy. They're less healthy. Yeah. I think Dad smoked cigars, and I think people put up with it, with how they did. I didn't, so he knew not to smoke in, when I was there. But a lot of the ministers and everything weren't game to say, for God's sake, put out this cigar. Um, so I think it must have been pretty awful for them. And physically, as far as my father was concerned, he did a lot of walking in his earlier days, but then people kept stopping and offering him a lift, and so he <laughs> gave up. And so that was a pity. So physically, he was not as fit as he should have. And my mother used to sort of force feed him a bit, I think. Yeah. Well, Bob, come on, I made it specially for you. And so, you know. anyway... Um, I don't know what it's like now. It's hard to tell. I don't know. Can't answer. <laughs> oh, my father never smoked. And in fact, the members of the Karajong got him to lead a deputation to the management to stop smoking in the dining room when it was introduced. Mm -hmm. I bet um, he was popular for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, men, the members asked him. He led the members, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr Chifley smoked, but not in the dining room. Um, and... Um, the park, but my father also walked a lot um, in his earlier days. But I think the lifestyle of constantly travelling and being here for long hours um, you know, 16 hours a day during the war, and then in his later days, he felt he had to be here all the time, sometimes I mean, in his last years till 1 a.m. Um, I don't think it was good for, for health reasons, no. And then my brother dying was another. You know, had a big impact too, I think. But, you know, probably you're healthier because now you've got a gym too. So. Yeah. Well, we'll have to leave it there, unfortunately, and thank you to both of you. It's been wonderful, and I'm going to ask John Alexander to more formally thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, ladies. This has been a real treat for all of us. And uh, your recollections, your contact uh, with the history of our country during a golden era, you really brought it to life. So thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to Michael Freelander, who's a great mate of mine at the Cornwall Menzies Club. But we were nothing until Maria joined us for lunch, <laughs> because Maria is the one that really grabbed this ball and took it to the touchline and then made the conversion. So we're really indebted to you, Maria, and to all of our colleagues who came today. Um, as in my first profession, um, 
which was playing prize money tennis, you, you don't have any game unless there's the prize money. So you always thank the sponsors and say thank you to the Museum of Australian Democracy, thank you to uh, Daryl Karp, Michael Evans and Edwina Jans for sponsoring this event. Thank you very much. Um, you both mentioned um, that you played tennis and that's a game that starts at Love All. Uh, I was once here for an event with the Dalai Lama and I thought that his spirit pervaded this place uh, as your great spirit pervaded this great place today. So thank you so much. I would like to have, if you think we should make this an annual event, could you just give us a little round of applause? <laughs> oh, well. well, that was easy. We'll see you this time next year. <laughs> and thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.